Good morning, everyone. The passage this morning is taken, the last verse of John chapter 7 and John chapter 8, 1 to 11. Would you kindly stand at the reading of God's word, if you're able? Then each went to his own home, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people had gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Don't you just love Jesus? <laughs> He's such a cool dude. <laughs> you may be seated. Well, uh, I am. Susan reminded me Jesus sat down to teach them, so uh, <laughs> so here I am. Um, yeah. So before we dig into these verses, we obviously need to talk a little bit about uh, what in some of your Bibles might be a little notation. Uh, others, you might say, "Hold it! Those verses aren't there." depending on which translation you are reading. Uh, others just make a note saying the earliest manuscripts do not include John 7:53 to 8:11. So, we should talk about this just briefly. Um, <clears throat> there are those that would spend a lot of time talking about great big words, concepts like uh, textual criticism and things like that, which is just the... Uh, process and study by which you look at a variety of the original documents or as close as we can get to them, whether they be fragments of papyrus, scrolls, early uh, translations and copies, etc., uh, in order to do our best to verify everything in the Bible as accurate, okay? Um, part of the challenge we have with that is, is the fact that in the last couple hundred years as they have found more early manuscripts, it has caused this particular section of scripture to be even largely questioned by a lot of people. Now, by all reputable, good Bible translating scholars, none of them that I can find would say they don't believe this to be scripture. The big challenge for them isn't whether or not this is a valid text. It's whether or not it belongs here in John, later in John, maybe over in Luke. That's, that's the bigger debate for them, actually. Um, but, and I, I actually have a little note here on my phone to remind me of who, who said what. Uh, <laughs> sorry. But it's... Um, when we are so far removed from the original, right? Uh, these words are written, 
you know, 1950 years ago approximately. It's not, we're not even close, right? And when you don't have somewhere enshrined John's original copy, you don't. We have to go by the copies and things we have. Now, when we have discrepancies, one of the things that we do is we look back at people that we would often call the church fathers. And for those of you that are history buffs, especially about church, you might recognize some of these names. But I'll just quickly go through some things. So, back in the 300s, there was a guy by the name of Ambrose. Now, that's not, not uh, Ambrose of Calgary. This is uh, Ambrose of Milan. Um, and he was a church leader. And he had issues with this passage. Interesting. In the 300s. He says this in a, in a sermon. In the same way also the gospel lesson which has been read may have caused no small offense to the unskilled in which you have noticed that an adulteress was brought to Christ and dismissed without condemnation. Did Christ err that he did not judge righteously? It is not right that such a thought should come to our minds. Why did he say that? Because the general public in the church of the time would have read this and felt Jesus didn't deal harshly enough with the adultery. And there was church leaders, so now we fast forward just a little bit. Now we get up into the 400s, and there was a guy named Augustine, and he says this, certain persons of little faith, or rather, maybe we consider them enemies of the true faith, fearing I suppose, lest their wives should be given impunity in sinning, remove from their manuscripts the Lord's act of forgiveness towards the adulteress. As if he who said, sin no more, had granted permission to sin. And there's others, different points in church history. So, I look at it this way. I fall into the camp that says, I can't guarantee you this is placed in the right spot in your Bible, but I feel there's more than enough evidence that it's Scripture, and there are many early church leaders, not unlike us all today, that sometimes don't like parts of the Bible. I don't know if you've ever met anybody like this, but I've actually met people that went through their Bible, tore out pages, cut out verses, because they just couldn't believe those ones. Can't do it. Hard as it may be, we may struggle with it. It might be difficult for us to understand sometimes, but it's God's Word. It's not for me to shape it. And I think part of the reason this passage comes into question is because there was early church leaders who didn't like it. And so it disappeared from some of their manuscripts. It is in a lot of manuscripts. That's why it's here. That's why it was in the King James when they translated. It was in a lot of them, but it was not in some of the oldest ones we've found. So that, I hope, gives you a bit of info on that. You can talk to me more if you have questions, or uh, there's a lot of info to study about it, but uh, I feel more than confident that it is part of the Word of God, and it is accurate, okay? So, with that, we want to, um, well, look at this text and uh, some of the different parts of it and things we need to learn. Um, one of the things that we want to make sure that we uh, focus on isn't whether they went to the Mount of Olives or Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, which actually symbolizes to us that he probably went and prayed because that's usually when Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and you see it later, right before the crucifixion, he's there praying. This was one of those places he went to, to get time with the Father, okay? Everybody else, though, went home. Um, in the morning, he's teaching, and that's the context with which this happens. Now, before we dig into the questions of uh, the final verses of go and sin no more and things like that, First, understand, not unlike our world today, there are those 
that would try and trap you. These leaders were trying to trap Jesus. I was going to get a, a Star Wars clip for you. It's a trap. I, I can't do the accent of that fish-headed kind of guy from one of the Star Wars movies years ago. But, but this was a trap. But guess what? It didn't catch Jesus off guard at all. They're trying to trap him. Now, I want you to think about the trap. That means they set this woman up. Talk about an abusive mindset towards people. They set her up. And they set her up hoping for an execution. Bad enough, they shame her publicly after they set her up. This is horrible. This is not some minor thing. This is absolutely horrific what they have done. And supposedly, these are spiritual leaders. It should break our hearts when we hear this. And you know what? It happens today. It happens today. There are people that are out to undermine the church. They undermine you if they can. And they certainly target church leadership to undermine them. Target them. And that's what they did. They were targeting Jesus, but they didn't care who they hurt in the process. That is wrong on so many counts. The ends do not justify the means. May we always learn from that. And so, this woman is actually a victim. A couple of different reasons for that. Uh, we'll get to it in a second. But here she's dumped in their midst. She's shamed publicly. It's in the temple. This isn't just in the streets even. So wherever this adultery had taken place, they have dragged her basically by force there, shaming her along the way as well, proclaiming she's been caught in the act of adultery. Now, in the law of Moses, we're supposed to stone. So this is very accurate. Law of Moses talks about stoning. Right? And, and they're trying to test him because they want to charge him with wrongdoing. Charge him with not being accurate to the law. But understand there's a cultural reality too of their context with Rome. So if Jesus says, yeah, stoner, they go, okay. We won't charge him with uh, any infraction for the Mosaic law. But we'll charge him with the Romans for calling for the death penalty when he doesn't have that right to do so. They've put him in a predicament. If he says, kill her, great, you're good with Moses, but now we're going to get you with the Romans. If he says, don't stone her, great, we have charges for you that you don't believe in the law. Rock in a hard place, right? So what does the law actually say? Well, Leviticus 20, verse 10 says this, If a man commits adultery with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress shall be put to death, surely be put to death. And then, in Deuteronomy 22, 22, If a man is found lying with the wife of another man, both of them shall die, the man who lay with the woman and the woman, so you shall purge the evil from Israel. Number one problem, where was the guy? Where was the guy? Number one problem, they didn't bring the guy. Why? I would suggest to you because he was part of the setup. He was part of the setup. To lure this poor woman into a sinful situation so that she could be victimized. How horrible. So were they right about the law? Of course they were right about the law. That's true. What they were wrong about the law was the fact of their hypocrisy. So let's consider it this way. We often talk about hypocrisy under the context of, okay, so if I'm going to be uh, very hard and stringent with people about, let's say, drinking alcohol, and I'm very condemning with them that they had a drink of alcohol, 
And then I turn around, and in the privacy of my own home, I crack open a bottle and have a few drinks. We'd say, great, that's hypocrisy. Clear understanding, right? Okay. But the facts are, any time we seek to condemn somebody with the law without first taking a good look at ourselves for the fact that we are lawbreakers as well, we are just as much hypocrites. It's not about the same action or infraction. It is about the fact that they did not recognize they were sinners, but were happy to point their finger at somebody else as a sinner. They didn't see their issues and problems, but they wanted to expose somebody else's. That's hypocrisy. That's something for all of us to learn from. It's not okay for us to point out somebody's sin because, well, I don't struggle with that sin, so I can point out their sin, therefore I'm not a hypocrite. No, it's bigger. We need to look at ourselves first. That's when, when the, the text talks about, you know, check the log in your own eye before the speck in your brother's. That's not talking about be careful that you have the same specific infraction. Rather, take a good hard look at your own sin condition, Amen. at your own deficiencies before you pick on other people. Amen. So obviously those guys didn't understand any of that. They believed themselves to be very righteous, very pious and condemning of others. So they continue right, to ask him, continue to prod him, will he answer them? I love it. Jesus says, let him who's without sin. So he's bringing up the very question, have you checked your own sin? When you do, go ahead and throw a stone after that. Are you without sin? Okay. And in fact, more than generically, but in the situation, they were sinning by what they were doing. A lot of people talk about what did Jesus do? He bent down and wrote on the ground. This, what, what was he writing? And there's all sorts of speculations out there. There's people that were like, well, I think he was, you know, writing the Ten Commandments. And somebody else suggests, oh, he was writing the names of all of the guys who were there and labeling some of their sins for them name by name. I don't know what he wrote. We don't have that info. But what I'm sure of is whatever Jesus wrote had an effect on them. Had an effect on them. Here's the first thing about the situation. So we looked at the law. We looked at that, yeah, okay, she, she was in adultery, but where's the guy? So if the guy's not there... What's going on, right? So then, the other thing from the Old Testament law is the hand of the witnesses shall be first against him to put him to death, and afterward the hand of all the people. So, who's the witnesses, right? So it starts with that. But in Romans, we get this reminder Every one of you who judges, for in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you judge and practice the same things. These guys were sinful, and they didn't realize it. They didn't see it. We need to see it when we're doing things. When, and it's not at all saying in this text that we don't deal with sin. It's not the, not the teaching of the text. But we certainly are not supposed to set people up for sin. We're also not supposed to be the harsh persecutors of people because of their sin. And we're going to learn from Jesus about the response to the sin. Keeping in mind the hypocrisy is summed up in James 2. Whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. In these guys setting her up, they were as guilty as anybody, and more so maybe. So, when they heard Jesus' challenge to them, and I believe with whatever he was writing on the ground, whatever that was, there was a response. Beginning with the older ones, they left one by one. So whatever 
between what Jesus said about he who's without sin cast the first stone and whatever he wrote on the ground, they got the point that they were the ones with the greater wrong in this scenario, in this situation. He was not at all saying the adultery was okay. Nowhere in the text do we see that. That's the, the, the challenge that Augustine would have given his peers of the time. Nowhere in here is it saying it's okay. But it is saying there's a bigger legalistic behavior we have to deal with. And we are not called to be the ones who condemn one another, especially without looking at ourselves first and foremost. So, Jesus says, they've all left, and just the woman is there. Where are they? Has no one condemned you? Right? Going back to that passage about the witnesses, right? Where's the witnesses? Where, where is the righteous witness to cast the stone? No one, Lord. Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. He has mercy. He has mercy. Because he understands not whether or not she had sin. He knew that clearly. But he also understood that she was a victim. And so he gives her some instruction now, right? From now on, sin no more. Amen. Sin no more. I cannot believe that people would not want to embrace the teaching of these passages. We are to be merciful to people. Amen. And we are to encourage them to repent, to cling to Jesus, to, to seek and desire to go and sin no more. That's part of Christian living. That's part of how we grow in our faith. And now, the fact are we don't know her road. We don't know what was the next day or the day after or the day after. I can tell you for sure she didn't remain sinless for the rest of her life because nobody in human history other than Jesus ever did that. But it's a lifestyle conscious decision, go and sin no more. And it means that today I'm going to strive to live a life honoring God, following His Word, and not sinning. But if I do, I also know the answer now. I also know the answer. Let's just look at a couple other texts here. Matthew chapter 9, Jesus says, Go and learn what this means. Might have been talking to the same people, actually. Never know. Uh, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. And Jesus is actually quoting Hosea. Hosea 6.6 6 says, For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and an acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings, which was an offensive concept in the Old Testament to Israel. What? Mercy? Sacrifice? You want mercy more than sacrifice. You want me to know God more than burnt offerings? That was contrary to everything they were doing. But it shows the essence of how we can miss the point. We can build ourselves a system of life where we're doing all the right things, not doing the wrong things, um, believing that somehow in doing that, God is going to be happier with me. That's not the gospel. That's something we call legalism. And it's hard because we can say healthy Christian living and the legalist living might actually have a lot of similarities in how they look to a lot of people. Maybe certain choices people make might look similar to an outsider or to somebody else. But the root reason you make the choice matters. Matters. So when you go from here today and you decide 
that you are going to sacrificially serve the Lord in a particular way. You're going to follow God's word in a particular area of your life. You're going to repent of and turn away from a sinful area in your normal lifestyle and instead embrace the opposite, the God-honoring way of living. Do it because of your relationship with Jesus. Do it because Jesus has forgiven your sin and brought you into the family of God, given you a relationship with the Father, and that out of that, you desire to live in that love, in that relationship, in honoring Him with what He says in His Word. That's totally different than if I do all these things and don't do those things, God will be happy enough with me. That's a false gospel. Rather, how we live changes because of our understanding of the love of God through Jesus Christ for us. Well, as we understand our sin and the forgiveness we receive in Christ, we begin to change. How we live changes. We dive into God's Word and we learn more of what it means to follow Jesus, and we change. But not because we lay down rules and regulations on you. No. And like I say, it might look a lot of the same in the outcome of what people might see, but the root, the core issue, vastly different. One is living faith a relationship with the living God, you residing in Him and Him residing in you by the Holy Spirit. The other is a man concept of religion. And unfortunately, it's popular. And there's even modern versions of it that are very popular. Right? There's modern versions of this. This is not purely what we might have seen uh, maybe... I remember as a kid growing up and encountering certain people, and I was a Christian, and they were Christians, and, and, and I was going to go to a movie with my friends, and they were like, whoa, 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 you can't do that, you're a Christian. And we started getting into the discussion of what this even meant for them, and for them, it was all the, well, you don't do these things, and you do those things, and, and me and my friends started talking about, well, yeah, but what about a relationship with Jesus? And they said, whoa, 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 what are you talking about? We weren't talking about the same thing at all. Okay, and and we understand that. We understand there's groups that label Christian, but they're all about works and not about relationship with Christ. We understand they're out there. We know it. There are modern groups that do the very same thing, different label and language. Only they use different terminology. It doesn't matter really what you believe about Jesus as long as you love well. Do the right things. Treat people good. Well, you know what? It matters what you believe about Jesus. It matters because how can you love well? You can't. The core things of our faith are there for a reason. Everything else flows from it. And so, be careful. Be careful who you listen to. Be careful who you read. And be aware, if it's not lining up with God's Word, run away. Now, some of you might be equipped to stand and fight. That's cool. (laughs) General rule of thumb, though, Just stay away from it until you feel equipped to deal with it, if that's your road in life. So here we are. We we are not those that throw away Christian living. We are not those that throw away repentance from sin and seeking to live righteously and go and sin no more. We believe all those things. That is us. But we also are not going to move over to the other side of dumping legalism on people and certainly not going to go to the far end of being the persecutors of others. It's not who we're called to be. Believe me, 
Here's how it works. I hope you know this by now. You go through your daily life. You've sinned. You're spending a little time with the Lord. Maybe you're praying. Maybe you're reading the Word. Maybe you're here in church. And there's something going on inside of you. We call it the conviction of the Holy Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit is the primary work that brings conviction of sin, not me. Don't get me wrong. There's church discipline texts and things like that. That's all true. But as a general everyday Christian living for us, the Holy Spirit convicts of sin, not me and not you. We try and help each other grow. So when we see a brother or sister, maybe they're immature in their faith. Maybe they're a newer believer. Maybe they're not, but maybe they're struggling. And we come alongside them. We come alongside them with relationship, and we come alongside them with prayer and God's Word. If through that they are prompted to deal with their sin, praise God. If they are not, here's what we don't do. We don't publicly shame them and cast them off and drag them out. We don't do that. We continue the process for as long as they will have us. If they get angry and frustrated with, what are you doing befriending me and praying with me and for me and reading God's Word with me and trying to uh, help me deal with this issue you call sin that I don't think it is? Well, that's being a Christian brother and sister. That's what we do. And if they cast us off, then we continue down the road of discipline. You get, you get somebody else to come with you because they're not willing to listen. But as long as they're willing to listen, you actually stay in that cycle. That's how it's supposed to work. That's what we do. It's not, well, I think that person is sinning, so I'm going to go talk to the pastor. Hmm, he'll deal with them. Yeah, nope, I'll probably send you back to talk to them. That's what I'll do. Because that's the right way. I'm not the police chief of the church. Right? And so, let's learn from this. How we treat one another, how we walk with one another, and how we don't treat people as well. And a great, great text and great reminder about the mercy of God, the grace of God, forgiveness in Jesus Christ, but He doesn't give you that to stay the same. He says, now, go and sin no more. Amen? Amen. Amen. What good news it is that Jesus does that for us. Saves us, forgives us, and sets us free to live in the way He's given in His Word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank You for this reminder from Your Word the reminder of your mercy and grace that we find in Jesus Christ, of forgiveness of sin and of going and sinning no more. Help us, Lord. Help us to not allow our flesh to reign in our lives. Strengthen us that the Spirit would reign in our lives. Help us to be people who grow more and more in prayer and the Word not only for our own Christian development, Lord, but that we would serve you better, that we would encourage one another better, that we would help one another better, and that we would be more effective in the work of the gospel in our community and around the world. Lord, guide our hearts and our minds that we would never be those who trap others, that we would never be those who persecute others, but rather that we would be those that bring people the hope of the gospel, that we would remind people of your word and that we would pray and that we would not run away from sinful situations, but that we would continue to bring you into those situations because you are the one who reveals the truth of sin, the conviction that is needed. You are the one that redeems and forgives. And so, Lord, may we be the ones who come alongside what you are doing in faithfulness to you and to your word. 
thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for your great patience with us. Help us to grow to be more like you. We pray this in your name. Amen.